Plot. City Lights. 1931. Heading. Actions. Button. Add a new plot. Ellipsis. Written by Hago. A little tramp living in the big city has a profound effect on two people he meets. The first is a wealthy man, who the tramp saves from killing himself during the wealthy man's drunken stupor. However, the relationship between the wealthy man and the tramp continually changes depending on the drunken or sober state of the wealthy man. The second is a poor blind flower girl, who lives with her destitute grandmother. The kindness of the tramp toward her makes her fall in love with him, as he is with her. By circumstance, she believes that he is a wealthy man. When he learns that an expensive operation can restore her eyesight, the tramp does whatever he can to earn the money to pay for the operation. Even if the result is that she will find out that he is not the wealthy man she believes in which by association may make her change her blind opinion of him. Voice over off. When you're blind and watching movies, what will you find? A blind superhero whose superpowers are acting like he's not blind. A sighted actor over dramatically touching people's faces. Or maybe the whole joke is that they're bumping into different places. A spectacular, macular. Welcome to Citizen White Cane. This is the podcast where um, we we put the blind people back in movies about blind people. Correct. <laughs> um, my name is Sky. And Clown. I'm Melissa Bakta. Um, and uh, we're we're here to talk about the movie City Lights. Yay! I'm so glad you picked this movie because I have actually. Well, obviously, I've never seen this movie, and I don't watch a lot of silent films, not because I don't want to experience the art form. Every, the rare few that I have seen every time I watch, I'm just like, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. Why am I not watching these? <laughs> and then I remember, oh, yeah, it's right. super hard to watch. For me. <laughs> yep. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it makes makes sense. I similarly, even going to film school, like, <laughs> really struggled with silent films. I definitely, at one point, had the choice to do, like, 1960s, before 1960s film history and after 1960s film history. It was two different classes, and I definitely picked after 1960s because I was like, I just want sound to already be part of movies. <laughs> well, and the hardest part of my, so I'm definitely, definitely didn't go to film school, but I I do have a minor in broadcast journalism. Uh, yes, and I have taken my fair share of film courses. Uh, one of the neatest ones I took was War in Cinema. And we watched, Ooh. it was almost all foreign films. I think the only English film we watched was Apocalypse Now. It was oh, all wow. foreign films. So it was really neat because these are films from countries that I, I, I've obviously never seen, never been to. So it was nice to be exposed to different things. Right. But it's... It's incredibly challenging uh, when you can't see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, like uh, that was another class. I really, my being a blind film student, you really have to make very hard decisions about what classes you can take. Um, but I, there was like, luckily, there one of the like requirements was like, I don't remember exactly what it was, but most of the classes were foreign film related. It was kind of like cultural it wasn't cultural diversity, maybe, but I, the queer cinema class was the only non-foreign film related class that fit that requirement. And so I definitely took that, though I would have taken it even if it wasn't like because queer cinema was very an exciting class. I even like audited the class before I took it because it was like full, but I wanted to like take it so bad so nice. <laughs> but I was like I can't do foreign films because it is like it's so hard to read the subtitles and and like audio descriptions can help mm -hmm. um but they are like very frustratingly not available for a lot of foreign films well and if I'm gonna watch a foreign film my first question is is it in Spanish because I have like six years of Spanish under my oh. belt so at least when I'm watching a Spanish film I can't translate it word for word but I can get the gist of what is right. going on Pan's Labyrinth is one of my favorite uh Spanish films because I I know exactly what's going on that's so nice <laughs> that I went to the theater saw, to see that one there I oh, couldn't read the awesome. subtitles yeah I mean but that's that's really great I'm like learning German on my phone so I'm like oh I should watch just like German films like which 
I like Run Lola Run was a film I grew up with. That was I was like, oh yeah, have you seen Run Lola Run? <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, bringing it back over to silent movies, yes. we watched a couple of the German uh, expressionist silent films. Those are really neat, uh, and even and obviously all the titles uh, in those are in German. But the one cool thing about silent movies is if you, if you do have you know, some vision and you're able to watch them is. I'm I'm always worried that I'm not gonna I can't tell what's going on I'm not gonna right. understand the story. Honestly, that's not you know I you can still understand pretty much what's going on and get the gist of the of the situation. I mean, even a film like Metropolis, which oh is yeah, probably, that and Sunset, uh, Sunset Sunrise. Sorry, Murnau's Sunrise are probably my favorite silent films actually. That was, a, well, Metropolis was definitely, like, a film I feel like I was part of multiple classes but was never assigned for some reason. Like, you would, like, talk about it in passing, but I never actually had it assigned, so I never wound up seeing it. I just watched it for fun. <laughs> oh, that's I, very I, cool. I, I was the same way. I was sick and tired of hearing people talk about it and reference it. I was like, well, I guess I just have to sit down and watch this thing. <laughs> right. That is the problem with, like, going to film school is you have to be like, well, I guess I just have to watch these movies. <laughs> And Sunrise, I was assigned to watch and could not find a copy of it anywhere. And then luckily, I was in college at the time, and we had student cable, and I happened to be flipping through the channels one night, and I hit Turner Classic Movies. What were they playing on Whoa. Sunday night? Yeah. That's very serendipitous. I know, right? It, it was awesome. It's so good. It, it's, it's, it's literally one of my favorite movies. It's great. And it was... Uh, it. it was on the cusp, I think, of the talkies. So because right. there are bits and pieces of it um, where there, like, there's a crowd scene. The two main characters get stuck in traffic and there's a, and there's a crowd scene and all these people are telling them, you know, move along. Um, and those are, that's words. There are sounds there. But they're just like, are they like um, off screen, like characters that aren't like actually, you don't see that whoever's speaking it, it? It was kind of like in City Lights where the characters would be moving their mouths a group of characters would be moving their mouths and you would just hear words. I don't remember if, if it necessarily matched their lips. Right. Or but it was cool because I was like, wow, I didn't know they were doing that at, at, in this, at this point in time. Well, actually, City Lights, so I did some research before um, we recorded this, um, but City Lights is in 1931 was the area it was made. So it was actually like the era of sound had already started um, and it was kind of like in a transitional period where like more and more studios were doing talkies but um, Charlie Chaplin at the time I'm th- pretty sure this was his last like uh, silent film um, but he was talking about how his like c- form of comedy wouldn't translate to like talkies um, and, and I think that's why later on Honestly, now I'm, like, downing myself. But um, that he, like, wasn't in some of his films. I think he was in other films after this. But but after this, um, they were they had sync sound. Well, because he made, and you're the film student, so correct me if I'm wrong, but The Dictator was right, the one where yeah. he talked in. And, yeah, and yeah. then everybody lost their minds because that's, that was his actual voice. Right, and I believe, I'm going to, I want to double check, but I believe that The Dictator was... After the, his movie, after City Lights, I'm trying to remember if there was one in between. Um, City Lights, then um, Modern Times, and then it was um, uh, The Great Dictator. So that um, it was close. That but um, but this like it's interesting because this is like kind of City Lights is like the classic. <laughs> silent film in a lot of ways right. like you, it's in high school it's the like the silent film we watched like yeah, when we were covering yeah. that era so it is very funny that it was like past really past the silent time of the silent era in a that, lot of ways that's interesting that you guys watch city lights because um back so i grew up in alaska and back in alaska when you were going to watch a silent film if you're and if you're watching chaplin and you were being introduced to chaplin it was gold rush is the one you watch right which it's well that's funny because i was in southern california so we should still care about the gold rush right yeah yeah, I, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Because there was a there's the huge gold rush in what San Francisco or where well where San Francisco is now. Right, right. Oh God, don't quote me on that. <laughs> I mean, no, I think it was. We definitely learned a lot about the gold rush in California history classes. <laughs> so that was. Um, but yeah, no, I I think that so 
also to talk about the why we're talking about City Lights, not just because it's like a classic Mm -hmm. movie of the silent era, but also because it's the the central love interest is a blind character. Um, And so what, I mean, just to go on first impressions, like how, (laughs) what do we feel about um, this character? You know, I'm not going to lie. I was pleasantly surprised actually yeah. uh for, well first off she uses a cane right she uses which at first i really because the first scene we see her she doesn't you don't really see a cane like a, no and and that's what i thought i was a little worried i was a little worried i was like okay here we go here's another depiction of a blind person they don't use a cane right they're like stumbling about or something right, right. that's completely and then you see her walk away with her flowers and she's got a cane it's very thin, right. thinnest cane I've ever seen, but she's got one. It is true, and it, it, I do because I was thinking about like what the timeline because it is thirty one, which you know it's a long time ago at this point. Like uh, um, how like the canes have um, like changed over time, um, and it's hard. I mean, I don't really know, um, but I know that they're. I, I can't imagine. I swear that the the. They're probably not that old of an invention at that point because they're they were I feel like something that started in the twentieth century, but I could be wrong about that. Like turn of the century, maybe. Well, it's, it's funny because I think of like early canes and the and the first picture I get in my head is like you know you got a blind beggar who's begging on the street and they're using a, a stick to get around. But then you, right. but then you think about where's that image coming from? Well, it's coming from old movies. So, right. I don't know. Yeah, because it is something that I feel like when I've learned when the white cane started, I was surprised at what a recent thing it was. Like, it's not like, I mean, obviously, it's not so recent in that it was, you know, existed by 1931. But it, it, it is more recent than you would think when it's like something that feels so basic. And it's also like as a technology. I mean, it's cool because you can like fold it up and that's pretty cool. But, like, it's not exactly, you know, like, a computer or something. Like, yeah, it's a pretty no. rudimentary and, like, just well, the mechanic. Now, now they've got those canes with computers strapped to them. Do they really? Have you... Okay, so I saw... This was going around Facebook a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there is a... Oh, I can't remember if it's a guy or a gal, but there there's someone who invented um, a cane that has built-in GPS. Why do you need that? <laughs> I mean, how are you going to get around? I mean, me personally, I use a white cane, but I need my phone to get around. Right. I, I do too. I have to know. Like, I have to have someone tell me, am I going to turn left? Am I going to turn right? I use it to navigate the bus system. I didn't take any classes or anything on how to use the bus system when I moved here. I just had my phone and I learned through trial right. and error. But who doesn't have a phone? Because I'm the exact same way. Like, I need my phone to get around, but... I still have a phone and I use it for enough things that if I got a cane with GPS, I wouldn't like ditch my phone. Like I would still have it with me. So then it's like, how, why do I need my GPS on my cane? Well, I can tell you that the, at the first and only uh, NFB National Federation of the Blind Convention that I went to, which was very fun, uh, there was a guy demoing his, uh, sonar is not the right word, but that's the word I'm going to use. His like (laughs) radar sonar cane. And it Whoa. had, it's a, it's a regular white cane with a, a box strapped to it. Um, not a very, not a very big box. It wasn't that cumbersome actually. And it was very, still very light, but the box was strapped to it. And this, again, sonar radar, I don't know, but it shot out waves to tell a blind person if they were going to bump into something or oh. like a wall or a person. Did it like vibrate? Or, yeah. And beeped and made noises and stuff. I'm not sure if it had GPS yet. Okay, but the the article I saw going around Facebook is is this GPS cane. That is really, I mean, I the one thing I worry about is like the more fancy things become, the more like unequal like the disability become. Like you know, like oh, the no, more there I is, get it. yeah, because it is still. I feel like being a disabled person, it's. Probably you're more likely to have less money. <laughs> yes. Well, okay. Have you? Okay, that actually brings up a really good example. Have you heard about this app called Speechify? Oh, 
That sounds really familiar. Yeah, I it's said. I can't remember how I found it on Facebook or email. I don't know, but it is a um, it is a text to speech reader, and you. Oh. You take a picture of whatever text you want to read, and then it, it has like OCR, like the optical character recognition. Yeah, yeah, and then it just inputs it into your phone, and it brings it up, and then you can listen to it, and you can just take pictures of entire books and put them on your phone and just go. So this is great. I was like, oh my god, I, this is, is I found it. Like, this Let is me guess, three hundred dollars. <laughs> About that, yeah, for, for a year, I think. A is year, it's like, like three hundred dollars. It's not even the app is three hundred dollars. It's it for a year. For a it's three hundred dollars. The, oh the app God. they give you a, like a three day free trial, which I did, and then uh, canceled because I I can't afford it, and I'm not yeah. sure if I want to throw down to the money to afford the system because I'm you can go month to month. I think a month is like 99 or some what but no. I, I don't understand what you're paying for right well also just like I in college like it took so long for them to convert my books to like readable formats and stuff that I would just literally have to do a lot of it manually and OCR technology is it something that you can like there are ways to find systems that do it online but it would really piss me off when because sometimes you it would be like oh you can't use OCR because of copyright infringement which oh my god made me so angry because I'm like you're just this is a tax on disabled people like you're just making disabled people pay more money but it's like I eventually was getting it through the school so it could be that like now it's harder to like get OCR technology but basically that's all the app would be doing then Mm -hmm. because if you have to go and take a freaking picture (laughs) every time every page then you're just you're really just using the OCR technology right. which you like sometimes can find free well the story of, the, of how the app was because I listened to it because it was on oh. there the story of how the app was, was developed was actually kind of interesting it, it's a guy who had dyslexia has dyslexia right. and he just reading for him took four ever. I mean, I feel you, man. Oh, yeah. No, totally. <laughs> I, I know exactly what you're going through. And so he created this app and now, uh, he, you know, he could, he can take, he took pictures of all of his college textbooks and he can just listen to them. He's like, I listened to them on the bus. I listened to them at the gym. I got all my work done. Right. I'm like, yeah, that's oh, what we yeah. mean. So, yeah. So I, I've been messing around with that and, uh, it works pretty well. Actually. I, the first thing I did was, uh, uh, input the play script that I needed to read. Oh wow, and that's difficult, and it's still it's not perfect. Uh, but but a play script is really different. Like it's formatted differently than a book, and you know this is well. I'm, that's the same with like screenplays too. Yeah, I mean they're yeah. they're slightly different in the way plays and screenplays are formatted, but it is still like yeah, similar. Oh yeah, yeah. So um, it worked pretty well though. It did. It, yeah. So I'm I'm pleasantly surprised. I'm not going to pay ninety nine dollars. Yeah. But, We'll see. I'm not, um, I think I'm just still using the free version, so we'll see. So does it have, like, a free version that, like, can you, what, well, when does it, yeah, have it a It says version? it's, so you can pay seven ninety nine a month, but I, I didn't do that. Right. And I still have the app on my phone and everything works. Um, so I just need to figure out what I can and can't do with it. Is that, so is, so is the 300 a month, is that? Or not a month, the 300 a year, is that not, is that a different app or is it that this one? No, it's or? the same app. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I, it's yeah, just like, like I said, I don't know what I'm paying for. <laughs> <laughs> I have no clue. Uh, but it's, re- it's really neat. It, so it has the ability to, um, which is what I really want to use it for. You can copy and paste articles from websites into it. Oh. And then it'll read them to you. Which... Oh, so the copy and paste, because that, like, I know on the iPhone, you can, it allow, it's like built into the iOS. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But sometimes, I don't know, it's never on my, on the phones I've had, I, I can't get it to work. I don't know why. I don't know what, what I'm doing wrong. Do you have an iPhone? Mm-hmm. Really? I have a XR. That, I can show you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I, yeah. Yeah, they're different. Do you do the speak screen? Not not very rarely uh because i kind of sort of have every, all the buttons memorized and i can see color uh, well, this enough to speak screen is um it's gestures so if you turn it on in the settings it's just like two fingers sliding from the top to the bottom of your phone um and so when you do that it will just speak everything on a screen so i refuse to read articles with my eyes even though you can like do the reader view and it makes the text bigger mm-hmm. it's still like once if it reads it to you then I'm like okay now I can actually 
like hear what it's what's being said. So oh, speak you, screen. You need to school me on that because yes. I, the one thing I cannot stand is not using a piece of technology to its full potential. Yeah, Both my parents have iPhones. God bless them. I love my parents, but oh my God, they have these little computers in their pockets. <laughs> and they use them to make phone calls right. and send text messages and take pictures and but maybe check the email. That's, yeah. Well, my mom plays music on hers only because I showed her how to do it. That's so funny. Oh, my gosh. No, my my family is very, I think, very tech savvy generally. <laughs> so I'm like, definitely, but I will definitely show you things. I'm all, And I'm also happy to PSA any, like, iPhone specific accessibility techniques because I'm nice. I need to get the word out. It's very important. <laughs> you're, and you're you're on an iPhone. Yeah, obviously you're on an iPhone. Yeah, as well. That's mine nice. is I think I think it's the X. It's not XL. That's not the but it's XR and then there's another the other letter. Oh, do you have a Max? Um, that's what I want. That is that the big one. That's the big no, one. No, because it's okay. like way more expensive. Oh, it's so it's oh like I'm God. just like yeah I mean I would but then again I'm like my pockets like th- it's gonna stop you know because I have to wear Lanny's clothing and they don't have real pockets so you can't like fit so after a certain point I'm like to see it or to be able to carry it with me like sucks that I have to <laughs> make that decision but <laughs> um yeah, it is. It's, I mean, it's hard. I'm, I'm trying more and more to just stop reading things because mm-hmm. I, like, I just don't want as many headaches. Um, yeah. And, like, since I've, like, not been in school for the last, like, five years, I feel like the amount of headaches I get have just gone down, like, exponentially just because, like, just... If I, I basically say, like, I will learn from podcasts, <laughs> I, if I need to read something, I am going to say I need this to be on a computer and I need to be able to, like, listen to it if it's a lot of text. And if it's not, I'm just going to say I'm blind. So this is, like, not really a thing I can do. Sorry. Like, if it's accessible, then I'll do it. Oh <laughs> but God, I, yeah, I used to see it. Crippling headaches yeah. in, in college, especially. Not... Not so much in I in high school and in elementary school and middle school. Like I remember maybe a few times, but oh man, once I went to college, holy smokes! And then moving here, I would just get, I mean, debilitating headaches. I couldn't yeah. headaches. I so bad I couldn't go home and turn lights on. Yeah, yeah. Well, that would be like so common for like trying to do reading. Oh, and then yeah. But speaking of school and not being able to and getting headaches. Um, <laughs> Bring it back around. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's in the so in the movie we <laughs> must do like my segue. No, that was great. That was great. I just realized like we went on a twenty minute. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it is. This is okay. I'm like every time I I feel like this is such a blind person thing. Um, anytime I talk with other blind people we have to be like oh right remember an hour ago when we like had this whole conversation that we like in the middle of got sidetracked on like it's, <laughs> coming it's back like, it's like adhd but i don't have adhd that's <laughs> i do so that also probably makes it even worse that you're we're getting both of the blindness Great. plus the adhd so um yeah but anyway my great segue back into the movie um <laughs> But yeah, so the character, we were talking about how, um, like, uh, how we were, it is kind of surprising the way that, that she's played. And actually, it was another thing that I um, saw that the actress whose name is Virginia um, Cheryl? Cheryl. Cheryl? Okay. I, I, I mean, I don't know. I didn't know how to pronounce it either. I Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. assuming it's Cheryl just because it's C, but it is CH, so who knows? Um, <laughs> but um, she, like, I read something that this was, like, one of her first actual acting roles. Um, but wow. it also, there was something I was reading that was saying that part of why she was able to sell the blindness was because she herself was nearsighted and so like because you can because I was really surprised the way her eye lines are like because I feel like uh, like sighted people are really horrible about like playing blind characters and like the way that the the kind of the eyes not really looking at anything okay I'm glad I wasn't the old because I actually noticed that too and usually I don't but I think with silent movies because there is no sound 
especially right. the music and the images, I'm paying much more attention. It's like foreign films. I pay much more attention to the sound and the music and whatever is going on because I need anything, something I can grasp onto for right. context. But anyway, um, no, her, I, by looking in her eyes, I'm like, okay, clearly she's not blind or fully blind. Right, right. Not totally blind. But yeah, there's definitely something there. Uh, yeah. The that eye, kind of like non-focusing yeah. kind of a, the ability to also like look towards someone but not focus in on them um and like i think i mean maybe it shouldn't be that hard but i also have very like low standards <laughs> for um like what impresses me i guess about people playing blind characters because a lot of times no blind people and and for this movie probably no blind people were talked to about it i mean it's not like this was at an era where you were trying to get these portrayals right um but i mean yeah no you're, you're totally right but that is really cool to know they cast a nearsighted person you know well, they at least they didn't cast a person with full vision right right though the one thing is apparently she was like i had a horror this is a horrible experience and really did not get along well with charlie chaplin oh, and yeah. like because like the accounts of like being on the set for the movie is just like that it was he's just like so controlling of everything things have to be well yeah because he directed this is his film right and he i directed think it and i i never think it's justified to be like a terror as a director <laughs> um i understand the kind of per, like the way that the like the physical humor is done you have to like to some extent have the ability to control a lot of different aspects of it i think when you have like that physical kind of comedy it definitely takes a lot more of like being aware of all the different aspects and being kind of controlling in in some ways but when you get to controlling humans especially what i imagine usually unnecessarily like usually it's not because people are the problem it's just because your inability to empathize with them is the problem um but i think that like yeah i get i get the sense of like as the director wanting to control things but i feel like if any actor feels really like just especially if a woman if a female actor feels, like, uh, really kind of stressed out or upset by a male director, there's always the assumption of, like, maybe it could have been better. <laughs> because maybe. usually women are not coming onto a set being like, I just, I'm going to be pampered, and then the male director is just, like, being reasonable. That's I don't think that's usually the... Well, and, I mean, we don't, and we don't know. I and mean, we don't have a time machine. Right. We can't reach back to 1931. She, that's very true. Though she was, a, the, though her it being her first role, I, am, I, I can't imagine she was a diva, you know, if no. it's your first acting role. Yeah, no. And I mean, to have such a, <laughs> a iconic role, like, I don't know, you know, I, I did very little to no research. So I don't know if she had any roles after this. But I think she did some things, but not too much. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this movie is watched by film students. Yeah. by people who want to watch silent movies, um, cinephiles. I mean, so <laughs> she's, her performance it lives, is captured and will live on forever. Yeah. So that's the coolest thing about film is, unlike ancient history, we can go back and pinpoint the exact date and time when film was born. Right. And, like, there, it is so recent that there is, like, that is something that I'm always like in awe of studying film is that like this is one of the most recent art forms that we have currently like you know video games probably <laughs> be one of the main ones that's more recent but like but it is like even if it's been over a century now like you know 150 years or something um but even I mean like narrative films it's only slightly over 100 like you know you're you're by the t the twenties, you know, maybe the tens, but it's not like you know workers leaving a factory. <laughs> right, <laughs> was right. exactly was or, the same or, as uh, <laughs> uh, the train coming to the station. Oh, yeah. I believe that was the first one, and then people actually fainted. I mean, people freaked the fuck out because here comes this train. <laughs> they literally thought it was going to come out of the screen at them. <laughs> I find that it is it is a very funny anecdote. I who knows how real <laughs> there that that yeah, but it is a very the whole train thing is so funny. Yeah, I but it is um yeah, I, I, I feel like it is such a new art form, um, that it is kind of 
interesting, especially how recently even, like, people in this film died. <laughs> you know, like, they were really just, like, at the... Like, it was the beginning and the long scheme of history, unlike other art forms that have, you know, extremely long, like, like music or something, where there's, like, almost prehistoric... Right, well, there's just, there's just annals and parts of music that you can't access. Right, right, you exactly. Never, you can never hear them. But film, you can go to the library or to a museum or uh, to an archive. Yeah. I want to watch something that Thomas Edison filmed. You can do that. You can do all, though I wonder once we're going to start losing things. Well, some things, I mean, some things are lost history and just like they weren't upkept and then Well, you have the Library of Congress. They they have a film archive and they are they archive different films and you have um the, the Criterion collection. Yeah, there's a lot well. of like work to like yeah, update it. It is it is kind of weird to think now. Like if you at some point drop the ball on as new technologies are getting invented, you can lose. Like there's still like we have to be proactive and making sure that we restore enough things. Because also like not every single film necessarily is being restored, especially like at the same quality, um, or even at all. And so I think that that. Would, it is also interesting to think. I feel like now with the internet, it just feels like everything well, is going to exist in yeah, <laughs> forever. Because well, I watched, so I rented City Lights on DVD at the library. They happened to have a copy and I was nice. there. Yay. And then I, for giggles, I was like, wait a minute. You can find, so believe it or not, YouTube is great for finding super old oh. uh, silent films or films that are out of print or just really obscure things. Right. Uh, City Lights is on there. Somebody uploaded it. Oh, wow. It's, yeah, it's on YouTube. I spent $3 for it. no reason. I know. I didn't want to tell you. <laughs> wow. It's okay. At least it's only $3. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't yeah, buy yeah. it. on. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's up there on YouTube, and I bet you dollars to donuts you can look up other Charlie Chaplin films, and they're... You yeah, I feel like her parts are on there. I was trying to look for like Buster Keaton films, and I feel like I found a lot of stuff that's just, yeah, on YouTube, just from, yeah, which is, well, copyright law. I don't know if it was as robust as it is now well, at that, that time. That's the thing. The, most of those films are in the public domain. Yeah. Now I wonder if like the movies being made to, today in 90 years, would they? <laughs> Ah, well, I can, I, my pr prediction, um, cause I'm all knowing, yeah, uh, course. my prediction is no, because when we can thank Disney for that, yeah. because Disney. they fucked around with the copyright laws. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now you could like own things like for eternity. Basically. Oh yeah. Basically. Cause technically Mickey, Donald, Goofy, Minnie, like all of those characters should be public domain. Right. Cause they've then, done it. I mean, that's, but they're not, and they never will be. <sighs> Very cool. I mean, my family is maintained through, like, IP and the protections of copyright law, and I'm still just, like, like, that's where my, how my dad makes money. And so I understand the value of it to some extent, but at the same time, I, like, even seeing that and the benefits of having it, I'm also, like, there has to be a limit to this. Like, you can't, it just can't be forever. And I think especially when you're protecting the, the IP to the extent that people do, like, I understand being like, okay, you know, we want to have the ability to distribute certain things. I mean, I loved pirating stuff, but I understand why they cracked down on it. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> I had to stop when I was in college because they figured it Me out. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got one too many cease and desist letters from HBO. You need to stop piloting True Blood. Oh, my god! Stop gosh. that. I remember that. Yeah, you would have, like, the campus Wi-Fi. Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I watched them all before I deleted them, but still. <laughs> that's it. Oh, gosh. Yeah, that's got to delete. If you're going to download them. I well, you know, it was, it was funny because the, uh, the, I would download things like South Park and music. I downloaded a lot of music. But a lot of South Park and a lot of music and a lot of audiobooks, and nobody came after me for that. It was only when I decided, mm, I'm going to download the entire fourth season of True Blood. Right. But yeah, that's, certain that's HBO. Certain so. companies are much more like 
I don't know if it's litigious exactly. I mean, sort of. The cease and desist, I don't know if that's really litigious exactly. Eh, maybe. But um, but there there's definitely, like, yeah, Disney or... Um, there's certain certain media making conglomerates that are much more likely to be like hawks when it comes to that copyright stuff. But you know, it's enough to take that whole thing down. But I mean, I get it. It's kind of like the Wild West kind of thing of like <laughs> you know chaos, and then eventually you it kind of becomes less chaotic. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I'm one of those people who's like, you know, by the end of all of this. Uh, I'm like, I can wait 18 hours to watch one episode of South Park or whatever I downloaded, or I can pay $3 (laughs) to watch it on Apple or to watch it through Comedy Central. Well, Comedy Central, I'm still mad at them Mm -hmm. for like making it impossible to even have to stream anything. I'm like, I'll give you my money a month, but they don't. There's no way to stream their content without having cable. It makes no sense. Oh, I didn't know that because I don't... I, yeah. Wow. It, well, because you, like... I was like, okay, I love Comedy Central stuff enough that I'll pay for if they have a, a streaming platform. They don't. They just have, like, the ability to stream if you already have Comedy Central for cable. Oh, gotcha. And well, I don't have cable. I'll, and a lot of their stuff... Uh, I can tell you that a lot of their stuff is on Hulu. Yeah. Uh, so if you if you have that or have any interest in getting that, you can watch it there. And then a lot of sketches you can find on YouTube, but right. you can't find the whole show. But oh man, I used to binge oof, loads of episodes of um, Amy Schumer of oh, her show yeah. on, on Hulu. I mean, just one right after the other. They're so Cause... short and they're so easy. Yeah, they sometimes have like I I'll have to figure out. Yeah, I need to figure out exactly how Hulu works. I feel like sometimes they'll release them like one like in a season maybe or something like or they won't because they don't have all of the comedy central shows on Hulu. no no and and i think that they're because a lot of streaming platforms will do the thing where the hulu doesn't always do this because it's more of a netflix thing where they'll wait until like the new season of a show is airing to like drop the la- the book the previous season which is weird i mean i keep hulu around a lot of the times because uh well, mostly because I was watching The Handmaid's Tale. But uh, I keep it around because if I want to watch current TV, right. that's where I go. Yeah. I don't have cable either. Right. Yeah, because I've been watching, like, Brooklyn Nine-Nine and um, a Good Place on there. And they – though I'm not caught up enough with Brooklyn Nine-Nine to be, like, watching episodes, like, of the current season. But I am with Good Place, and so they – tend to put them up they right just wrapped us. that show no yeah. i know spoilers because i haven't seen i know but... me neither because i'm still i i still love binging so sometimes i'll wait a few weeks to watch <laughs> um <laughs> but yeah so um oh god what were we talking about oh yeah so <laughs> so city lights is free on youtube you can go there and watch it yeah yeah so it's free on youtube but it's, it is uh, it's, it's 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 an hour and 27 minutes yeah it's not a huge commitment it is and i think it's really i mean it's interesting i think that i was expecting to be more upset by it <laughs> as Actually, always yeah. uh, like it is i think it there for the time i don't think that it was overly like I mean, it, like, it is definitely problematic in a lot of ways <laughs> for well, the modern era. Yes, but yeah. f- the fact that it was 90 years ago, part of me is sad that I'm like, I don't even know if movies aren't all that more progressive now. <laughs> well, it, it definitely propagates. <laughs> my my own, my only problem with it, honestly, because I really didn't have a huge problem with it. Yeah. Uh, my, my one big problem is uh, she can see in the end. And it, yes. it keeps going on with the trend that, all blind yeah. people need is the ability to, to, to see, see and everything right. is okay. Right, right. And that that would also be like, that's how he saves her. Um, it, first of all, she doesn't need saving. No. <laughs> that's the first thing. Um, and the second thing is the idea that like, if he's trying to help her, like, even if it was like, I'll drive you around. <laughs> Like, I could see that's still kind of problematic and that he's, like, that there's, like, an uneven power dynamic. But, like, for 1931, 
I'm sh- that's fine. Um, but I mean, we meet her and she's like a she's a self employed woman, right? Like she has a job. Her flowers. And I know. Taking care of her grandma, and, and, you know. Yeah. But then once she like gets her eyes back, all of a sudden now she like works at a flower store and like she's now a more legit flower seller. And it's like, what you was could, the difference? Yeah, she couldn't do that. It's like she just no eyes society, yeah, I way. guess, because it's like if she could sell flowers on the street, she could sell them in a store. But the fact that getting her eyesight back like is the reason why she's now able to have a store i mean it's it's the it's a trope as old as the bible you have the blind beggar and they that you know that's all they can do is sit on the street and beg or in her case sell flowers flowers yeah she but she had a job she was making some money though not enough to keep their um house or kind of like It's flat of some kind. Um, The movie takes place in a nondescript city. Yeah. (laughs) Because I I think it's supposed to be a mix of a few different cities. You know, and yes, because I felt like I was like, oh, obviously this takes place in New York or whatever. And then I noticed in the car when Charlie Chaplin and the millionaire. Right, it's the wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the wrong side. Yeah, yeah, I I noticed that too. What's going on? Because, and I read it, it's not supposed to like take place in any specific city, but it's like modeled after Charlie Chaplin's hometown, which is in England, which is probably explains the the car thing. Um, But it isn't supposed to be any specific like it's yeah, kind of supposed to it's be something that's any like, town, right? Exactly, town, any USA t- or right? Yeah. Any town, USA slash UK, um, and it's actually a lot of the like kind of I guess inspiration that, that Charlie Ch- they talked about in the book um, f- uh, is that like it's kind of supposed to be since there's the two characters, the blind girl, and then there's the the other character that we haven't talked about yet, um, who is like this drunk millionaire. Oh, right. We, and we meet him on the docks. Right. And he, about to kill himself. Yes, he wants to commit suicide. Yep. Right. Um, and and then um, the tramp, Charlie Chaplin's character, obviously, um, <laughs> saves him from killing himself in a very um, slapstick, physical humor way. I thought, I thought it was cute. <laughs> I, I did too. Okay, so I can speak from someone who's done a whole lot of suicide intervention <laughs> with people who are drunk. Um, <laughs> it was weirdly, it felt weirdly accurate of just like the, <laughs> the very like, just, oh, I mean, his suicide intervention was mostly like get him to not throw himself over the, into the water, right. which is like good safety planning, first off. His, but his, then his like his argument was like, "You have more to live for." And then he birds, was like, "Yeah, you're birds right." Will sing in the morning, and, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then the millionaire is just like, "Okay, sure. oh yeah, you're right. I should live." Which like, though he's drunk, and I do feel like the one time that that kind of thing can happen is when someone is already drunk. That there is like a lot of like going like very extremes. <laughs> And so you could sometimes get people to completely change, but I don't think it's that easy. Um, I think that, like, but, I mean, there are a lot of ways that people try to, like, stop people from killing themselves that are not helpful. And so I'm like, you know, that one, if nothing, even if it didn't work, at least it feels kind of harmless. It feels not very, like, (laughs) not super, like, help. Not, I mean, it, maybe for someone it could be helpful, but it isn't. At least it's not doing any harm, which I think a lot of times people's go-to can be harmful or at least, like, invalidating for people. But to say, like, you have something to live for is kind of what suicide intervention is. I mean, you're, like, trying to find, like, different, like, things that people are already living for, not just telling them that, like, you want to talk with them first and hear what's going on in their life to then kind of figure out what the things like that are pro pro life is not the right word <laughs> but but pro, like pro living pro living yeah yeah um uh, well and um i mean getting back to the whole yeah the slap the slapsticky comedy of the moment i think in, in that bit especially it's beautiful in the sense that there's such a, a weird rhythm yeah to everything it is like a, a, dance. a dance you and you see the joke play out, you know, the, uh, uh, drops the rock on, on Chaplin's foot. Chaplin ends up falling in the water and you know what's going to happen. It's all, it feels very predictive. Uh, and yet it's still so much fun to watch and you watch it. This same joke happens, what, two or three times. They, 
each of them falls in the water and then he chaplain climbs the tramp climbs over the millionaire to get up and then pulls him out of the water and then they fall back in the water again yeah. yeah yeah there's like a lot of um kind of yeah it is very dance like i was thinking that as well it um yeah i mean it's a cute scene i think maybe that was i feel like not needing to specifically relate to the blind character no i know that <laughs> kind well, of helps you to see it more yeah well and that that's interesting about uh, because we're talking about the blind character in this movie and i'm like mm, she has all of what 20 not that's generous yeah 10 minutes of yeah screen she time? really has so little and most of it is i mean also she's not really a person like you know, no, she is the object of right, want because right, you see right. her. She's shot uh, her her their house, their flat. Just ha- just so happens to have a the perfect like balcony window right. that she can feed her birds and tend her flowers on, and it's all shot from the tramp looking up at her. Yeah, because she's a damsel. She's yeah, she's an object of want. I as well, and then Rapunzel. She, <laughs> it is yeah, Romeo and Juliet. Rapunzel. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. and then she literally kind of becomes the damsel in distress because she gets sick. Right, right. So then it's like if, like, blindness kind of gets conflated with ill... I mean, I guess sometimes it's a... a sim- or, um, what is the right word? I'm kind of like an after effect is not the right word. But well, yeah, um, there, you can you can get sick and go blind. Right, exactly. I mean, it, it's, yeah, it like happens. scarlet fever and all yeah, that. Yeah. Um, but... But yeah, so, but then she's sick. It doesn't seem to, it just seems again like a weird plot device because it's like, I think when she's sick, it is because he's going to, he needs to overhear something. I'm trying to remember why. Because he like goes to find her where she was, but she's not there. there. And then he goes back to her place to find out that she is sick. And then, um, yeah, I'm trying to remember why, because I feel like that there was some reason in the, I mean, there had to be some reason in the plot that that happened, because <laughs> it was just, it felt kind of weird, like it felt weirdly unnecessary, no, but then I, there were, yeah. I, I think I got it. Well, I, not as, as far as not the reason why it happened, but that's why, that's what leads into the boxing match, which in my humble opinion comes out of fucking nowhere. It really does. But but he's determined to, to raise money to fix her to kill right, her so right. she can so she can go to the doctors or whatever and um <laughs> to do this he enters a boxing match right well and that's but that's after he finds out that the rent is right. that they're oh, about the, to get evicted the rent note yeah right also their rent was like twenty two dollars and ninety five cents right right Damn. Which, no. i know i know i oh my god imagine man i saw that was like oh <laughs> like i i kept thinking oh wow so they already paid eight hundred dollars this month why are they getting oh, exactly, evicted exactly like, what, is that? <laughs> what is happening right okay <laughs> oh my god twenty two dollars yeah i mean inflation i guess but who knows oh, yeah yeah major inflation but so anyway so he has to get the rent money back right so he uh, he decides to enter a boxing match. Yeah, which is... And that feels like it goes on for so long. It does. There's so It's like its own movie. It does, but it's super entertaining. I, I'm not going to lie. It, it, it is a very, like... It is a very, like, the most, like, specific game kind of, like... Like, it's just such a simple idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then and then you have, like, you can kind of, you, you basically can see where it's going, <laughs> like, with each step. Because we start out and he, like, the reason why he answers the boxing match, I mean, to even before that, is because he's getting the money from this drunk guy who's suicidal. Um, but then anytime the drunk guy sobers up in the morning, he doesn't even remember the tramp exists and then like it just throws him out and is like mad at him for you know being in his space or whatever so he can so basically Charlie Chaplin's character can only like depend on the rich guy when he's drunk so then he is both sober and then I think he might it might be when he goes to Europe too because then he also goes on a vacation so the (laughs) tramp's not able to to use him for money so he like is gets fired from his job at a stable 
And then while he's just like sad wandering around, some guy's like, hey, do you want to like make an easy 50 bucks? Like I'm going to throw this like boxing match. And so all I need is someone who can lose and then I'll give you half the proceeds because I don't want to actually fight. And then (laughs) and so it's like, okay, that seems like simple way for him to get money he really needs money right now and, so until he realizes to get the money he has to get punched in the face a right. bunch of times which is like its own thing of like like is this guy gonna hurt him but he says he's not but then of course it's like okay but it's in my head i'm thinking like there it's not gonna be that they that he just fights a guy that's gonna try to not hurt him like that wouldn't make any sense and the guy has incentive not to like actually hurt charlie chaplin's character so what happens is the the one the kind of crooked i guess and that he's you know throwing the match guy gets is told i love how he gets a note that just says the police are after you jim (laughs) i think it's jim i it's so like very like specific name (laughs) <laughs> then it was just signed. <laughs> we do not know who Jim is. No, it never comes up again. <laughs> yeah. But then the guy is like, oh, no, and he runs off because the cops are after him. And so, like, they get another guy just randomly up the street to fight the tramp. And this guy is like, he's th- a big guy. Right. He's a big guy. And then even though he's like an amateur that they got up the street, he's just like apparently very... <laughs> Strong. Well, the trip is a twig. Right. And he's so skinny. Right, right. Well, because that's the thing is it's like you put him in a situation of fighting and it like the only reason he would be in that situation is because he's being told he's not going to get hurt because there he just doesn't stand a chance. It's, it is classic comedy. It's, right. It's, it's the opposition of opposites. It's the like, flipping of expectations. It's everything right. that it's so neat. It's everything that we expect from comedies now. Right. They did. Yeah, it is a very, I mean, it is kind of like a very classic kind of construction. But then, like, and then there's also, like, the showing, I guess, showing, not telling all silent movies have to do that all the time, except for yeah. Jim. Who's yeah. <laughs> the arbiter of kind of like a plot device exposition. Um, <laughs> um, they, but yeah, so then, um, the I'm trying to remember the because you see like a match is happening and it's like oh this is like a real these are real fighting you have a character we meet and he has like lucky charms that he like uses to like be lucky um like a, a rabbit's foot thing and so he's about to go on and he's doing the rabbit foot thing and and Charlie Chapman's like oh can I also do that to like do be lucky and then we see the same guy with the rabbit's foot coming out of the match and we don't see the match but we see him just like them running with him like and he's like passed out and they're trying to like wake him up and then then Charlie Chaplin's like oh no no the rabbit foot's not lucky (laughs) and then then, um just at that moment I'm trying to remember because they because after the that scene there's like there's another heightening of like the 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 anticipation other than just the guy gets beaten up. Maybe that's it. I think that might be it. I mean, the biggest, the my favorite bit in the in that entire sequence is uh, the, tra- the tramp. Instead of, well, the, he tries hiding behind the referee. Right, which right. Which is great. That's that, that so is cool. Like, that was my favorite, like, dance because mm-hmm. well, that was a real dance like the three of them yes. and just that yeah. all so of the physical it's, humor it's in the, the ring. referee in the middle the tramp is behind him and then the fighter is on the other side and it's just it's a mirror i mean it's it's just mirroring right it's so cool is you know obviously whenever the big guy moves the tramp moves the ref moves right right and the big guy can't punch the ref <laughs> right right and then and just that that the dance it is so genuinely like a dance moves that even like there are times where the ref is not because <laughs> they keep switching the three of them so that they're in a different order and there's like one time where the it's like <laughs> i don't even remember what it is but it makes no logical sense because like the ref is on the is on one of the s- sides so that they are still next to each other but then because of i don't remember it's like that it looks like almost 
like the the big guy, the buff guy kind of is acting as the ref and then like and then the ref and Charlie Chaplin's character are like facing each other. Like there's a lot of like kind of subverting it. Like it's kind of almost like cartoon logic. It feels very cartoony. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if, you, if you think of like Tom and Jerry cartoons, you know, or older older cartoons, I mean, well, they were silent movies in a way. Like yeah. they relied on silent gags. You could heighten everything because it's animation. Right, right. But, but it's it even the like same structure. The way that that scene is set up feels like it is kind of like it it feels like a kind of comedic Oh yeah, I mean like I, heightening in a yeah. It, I could probably find a, you know, I'm sure there are there's got to be car- I know there's cartoons about boxing. I could right. we could probably find old Warner Brothers cartoons, Tom and Jerry Mickey Mouse, you know, whatever, and you'd see the exact right. same scenario. It really play does. out in the exact same way. And it is interesting to think if how like kind of the um, chicken egg. I mean, like it's not really chicken and egg because you can very clearly see which one, <laughs> which one started the thing because they have dates. Um, but but it would be interesting to see how much of that like. Because I wonder if some of the, a lot of the cartoon stuff was just imitation, like imitating like the this era of like silent films. It had to have been. It must. Oh. It must have been. Yeah. That's yeah. I mean, I I can't confirm that, but right. Wow. Growing up watching, you know, years of Looney Tunes and Tom and Jerry and Mickey Mouse. Yeah. You see, yeah, you see a lot of the the same gags or different versions of. Yeah. yeah. Well, but my so my favorite part of yeah, the boxing yeah. match is uh, <laughs> the tramp. The tramp is a hugger, not a fighter. <laughs> yeah. He decides the only way I can keep this guy busy yeah, is just right. hug him. <laughs> just hug him every opportunity. Oh, oh, and the other great thing is when they. <laughs> I, this is my favorite was when they have both fallen down and then and like the ref is like counting one two three and whoever he's counting like as he counts they're getting up but then the other person has fallen down so the instant that the person that he's counting gets up he starts to count the other person and then they do that which is very like cartoon classic gag. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in which so that's so that's a lot of fun, kind of like very tangible. It takes a significant humor, part of the movie, so but, long. but it's so funny. Yeah, it's like the. I guess in a way, it's. I mean, is it sort of the climax? No, it's not. It's because it's it's a precursor because it's like because then due to the fact that it was he really didn't have a chance, he loses the um and so. And because the guy, the original guy was like, we'll split it 50-50, but this guy was like, no, it's fair fight, gotta actually fight you, and then I'll get all the money. Um, so he doesn't, that doesn't help him at all. So it was a bust. <laughs> yeah, so then, then we get to the climax of the film, which is kind of like coming back to the drunk guy. He says that he needs to pay, he tells the drunk guy he needs to pay for... I think he tells him flat out, like, I need to pay for the um, the blind girl's surgery. Mm-hmm. And so the and so he's like, oh, do you need money? Here's, like, $2,000. <laughs> I can't be sober at this point or drunk? I no, can't. he's drunk. He's drunk, right. Right. Right, because he's given him, he's given him his car already. He takes him to that nightclub. Right, yeah. right. And then, and so then there's, like... So then he's basically like, okay, so now he's just giving him the money and it's it's not even like he's, the tramp is not even tricking him into giving the money. He's just like flat out giving it to him um, for the specific reason of to play for the, the surgery, pay for the surgery for the blind girl. So then it's like, okay, now he's gotten what he needs. He just needs to get there. But then before he's able to get there, there's a robbery, <laughs> I think. Um, that's what starts it off. And you have, you still have the gun that he at some point was using to like, to, uh, like threaten suicide in the, at the beginning of the movie. And it's Chekhov's gun, even though it does go off in the first scene that we see it. (laughs) It has to go off again, I guess, once we see it again. Um, (laughs) but, um, it does, uh, like, uh, the I'm trying to remember exactly because that because then there's a whole big thing with like because he turns off the lights at some point and is like trying to get away 
with the money. But then at some point he gets like Charlie Chaplin's character. Oh, is there a robbery or is it just that? Um, I don't remember. A maybe robbery. there's not. You know what? I think there isn't because I think it's just that he gets told like because the drunk guy not only doesn't like like he was just when he sobers up, he always forgets right. that he, that Charlie Chaplin exists. Um, and so, so yeah, I think that's, that's right. There's still something with the gun though, I think is what I'm trying to remember. Like there, it's a lot of, the, <laughs> there's some reason the gun comes back into play. I don't know if it's like that he's suicidal again. But you, because for some reason, Charlie Chaplin needs to wind up with the gun. I don't think he takes it with him, but he has to, like, hide it from the situation. But then I think the police have guns, and they give it... It's a lot. It's apparently not super memorable exactly how it all happens. I was like, wow, I don't... (laughs) No, and I'm like... This whole section of the movie is so fuzzy. I know. It is weirdly, like... I maybe just because it it follows right after the the boxing match, yeah. And I feel like it is a little bit more convoluted. Maybe it is more like a visual because it is harder to tell exactly. At one point, he I know that at one point the power goes out, which I think is something that Charlie Chaplin's character does to mm-hmm. is like to take the power to kind of confuse them. But basically, he Charlie Chaplin gets the money. Like in a, like in a in a up and up way, and then he's just this drunk guy just gives him the money. Then because he sobers up, doesn't know Charlie Chaplin exists, assumes that he's being robbed, and then that's it, right? And then Charlie mm-hmm. Chaplin has the money on him because he needs it, and yes. so it makes it look exactly like he's he robbing, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and so then he, because of that, he basically is on the run. So he has to just like come give the money to the blind girl and then, and then just be gone because of like the fact that he's wanted, um, criminal. And then we get to the last scene in the movie. <laughs> uh, and probably one of the most iconic scenes. Yeah. I mean, you think about, you, you said we were going to watch City Lights and even though I hadn't seen it, the two scenarios popped into my head the the scene on the street corner where they first meet with the flowers right this ending scene because i right. i knew that she gets her sight back at the end of the movie right right and that is like one of the most iconic scenes of like yeah the yeah it's one in movies i guess also <laughs> um yeah it is it i mean it's definitely like i think something that sort of bothers me about the whole movie is that like we were saying before like she's not a character and like that she's entirely supposed to be like kind of a projection and like a plot device for right. Charlie Chaplin's character like she has no agency she has no even she, feelings really about anything yeah she gives <laughs> she gives the tramps character agency i mean you see right. you see her and her grandmother in in their flat uh, but uh, this scene does not pass the back. I was about to say that's because they're, exactly talk, what I was they're talking say. about. Oh, did you? She's, She's like, like I met must someone be so nice. I'm, he's so rich. Yeah. I'm like, wow. Okay. Cool. Yeah, not Great. so not passing the Bechtel test, and then that's literally they're not even talking about multiple things. Their entire conversation is about him. Um, yeah, and that is the only scene where two characters talk to each other. Though none of the characters have names, which is a question of the Bechdel test. Oh, yeah, if no, if no one has names, then do they need? Does the characters, the female characters, have to have names? But um, but yeah. So um, there. Yeah. So you don't really ever see literally everything that she thinks is kind of like in relationship to him. Um, or like the same as what he like if she if he wants something for her, then it's like, oh, well, that's what she wants. Um, <laughs> but then the one time that you're asked to really like see the world from her perspective is when she gets her eyesight back, because that's right. why that's the whole point of that scene is like the realization of she thought something and now she like sees him with with real eyes or whatever, quote unquote. Um, but it, it, it's it's the whole thing that um. In order for her to be loved, not find love, right? But to be loved, she she has to be fixed. She can't, right? Right, and she's not a whole person. That he like that, that that's almost like a way of him being 
like a kind of the key to her <laughs> like yeah that they're that to make the relationship work because it's also like he probably wouldn't have gone i mean if he helped her with her rent then that's 22 dollars you know like the real <laughs> the real like a plot of the movie hinges on the fact that he needs a lot of money for the surgery so there's like this thing that like yeah he he needs to fix her is it is it ever stated that she would die without the surgery because no. i remember her being sick or right but that yeah. does nothing to do with her eyesight that we right. can tell like because right. it's just like it's a cure for blindness is what they say like it's literally there's she's doesn't there's no reason for her to get it really there's it's, no it's gross i mean it's 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 her blindness that is making her sick it's Right. I have I have no place in this world. Why don't I just, you know, curl up into a ball and die? Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and but then once I have sight, I get my whole store. And then I also get to be a character that people are supposed to empathize with. <laughs> like, because you're like... Instead cause, of pity. Right. You don't have empathy for this woman. You pity her. Right. Well, and it's not until the end that it's like... Because it really is the whole point of that scene is she is the shifting of context. Like, she... The whole movie, her psyche is, like, somewhere else, basically. And I feel like in a lot of ways, the movie is just, like... Just what she's thinking is, like, a faraway blob that no one wants to, like, contemplate. But then at the end, it's, like, the idea is she... Now she is able to now we we look at her realizing who the tramp is and so instead of like seeing her through the tramp eyes which you've done up until now now you're seeing the tramp from her eyes but she has to be cited for that to happen it can't like be that you from the beginning are empathizing with her because a blind character can't be empathized with <laughs> i did one point one point i'll give to the scene is i did like she recognized, she, obviously she couldn't recognize him from facial features because she's never seen what he looks like. Right. But she touched him. They touched. Which I, I thought that was kind of sweet. That's a, I, <laughs> I feel like, a, I don't know. It's, I, it, I, I thought it was a little questionable on why she wouldn't like recognize him from a voice instead. Sure. Yeah. Because I feel like. A, the sound of his footsteps or something. Right. I mean. Especially, like, a voice is something that if I, like, somehow got vision that I didn't have. I mean, I'm trying to think about it. But that's, like, the thing that would be the most recognizable of someone. But I can't really empathize with having all my vision back or whatever. Like, that's well, not yeah, the thing but, I think but about. That's, that brings it back to the fact that it's a silent movie. Right. We can't show that she recognizes him by his voice because we can't hear his voice. We can't hear her voice. But we so could we hear her. To... We could see her hearing his voice, I feel like. True. Yeah. Because there is like, because that is kind of something that could, I mean, it's just like, have, would you ever be able to like identify someone by touching them? I mean, like I can no, identify you, someone's clothes. Yeah, yeah. No, you're you're right. I've never I've never actually tried to do that before. <laughs> right, and even though he has like a his uniform, I mean, I can't imagine like feeling someone's is, clothes and knowing who they are. Yeah, no, it is. I you know I fell victim to movie cliche. Right, right. Because this I this isn't the first time that this something like this is done. Right. Well, it is, and I think that that's like part of the promise that you just, you don't really have realistic portrayals of blind people. And so when they're in a movie, it's all metaphor, which this movie, um, I think I started talking about this before, but like, it's supposed to be that the two characters are, the blind girl is supposed to be a stand-in for Charlie Chaplin's mom, who um, was um, like, suffered from like, mental health issues and was, um, institutionalized like because of that and so it's the blindness is supposed to be a metaphor for like sanity kind of and so so it's supposed to be like that what he wanted of having like a mom who was so it's his like, wish, wish fulfillment right basically. right and then yeah. and then having the and the drunk man who's kind of like you know vacillates between being kind of abusive and and you know <laughs> suicidal or freewheeling kind of yeah um it's supposed to be his dad who was like who was an alcoholic um but also like but was abusive which I don't need to go together but it did um <laughs> but yeah so um 
that I think is supposed to kind of seeing the movie from that lens, it's supposed to be like what Charlie Chaplin wanted. Yeah, that wish fulfillment of like having a mom that was, you know, I mean, I imagine and it's so hard because like the way that mental health is dealt with at that you know, in like the turn of the century, is just gonna be like it's a, it's problematic now. Well, yeah, I mean, this, this, this was this was something is is wrong in your head. Well, you lock them in a room, right? For right. The rest like of their lives. there's so many like people who are just like this woman was being abused. Like, well, and she like had PTSD. Well, she can go to you know, Put her she's in a room. insane. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's not like it is very problematic. So it's very hard to tell how much because it could have been that she like, had something that is, like, more something that, I mean, you know, I think we still have extremely problematic ways of dealing with, like, different, like, schizophrenia and different kinds of things like that. I think we do a terrible job of dealing with that in this country. But if, you know, I, I think that sometimes that can be, I think that's a narrative that people can relate to still of, like, having a guardian that has, like, that has mental illness that really does affect their ability to function in some ways. And I think that that's a very complicated thing. And he was trying to right. work and through it. I can understand you know, that to some movie. extent. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, it's kind of admirable. He's going to, I mean, it's definitely better than something like uh, escape from tomorrow. What? Oh wait, what is that? That so that's the movie that was filmed covertly uh, in Disneyland and Disney world. <gasps> What? Oh my god! Okay, we have to watch this thing for fun because it is absolutely batshit insane. <laughs> and is it's it? This, it's this guy. It's this director who's trying to like work through all his childhood traumas. It's great. It's oh terrible. My gosh. Uh, it's so bad. We'll have to like. We need to do. We'll do bonus episodes with movies yeah, that are we, we have to watch this related. Yeah, it's so. That it's sounds so really. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, okay, well, we'll definitely, um, but yeah, so that, I think it's, it gives context to the movie, but you can definitely see how it is, it is kind of like his way of rewriting history. Yeah, well, his, or his, his childhood. Personal, yeah, yeah, his childhood. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and kind of like, yeah, seeing it from a more metaphorical, because it is like, because he also was like houseless growing up so a lot of it is like taken very directly from his childhood experience well that explains the tramp doesn't it right exactly <laughs> it's his whole it's character very, yeah, yeah yeah very personal which right what's you know right right and i think that that like in some ways i mean it gives it another dimension but it also like i feel like the way that his relationship with his mother if he didn't really know her that well you know i think there is like an and, you know, I think that at that time, the way that she was treated is not through empathizing. Like, there's a fragility in her character, and there's also a lack of, like, really understanding what's happening with her internally. She's glass. I mean, yeah. it's like she's made of glass through the whole thing. It's, she's li- And in the balcony scenes especially, she's literally put on a pedestal <laughs> as, above, as above everyone else because yeah. she's this fragile creature. Right, that needs to be saved. And, mm-hmm. and that is something that, you know, you, like, it is something that I think we deal with still all the time and like navigating that in 2020 is is still difficult I think especially for many blind female identifying or yeah I mean all blind people but as but especially having that double um yeah being both blind and a woman (laughs) um (laughs) it definitely makes it um you know, I, I think we've gone somewhere, but we just haven't gone there yet in this current time. I mean, at least it's it's a happy ending. I mean, you you assume that they they both end up together. Two whole perfect people end up end up together. And she still has her flower shop, right? So that's cool. Which why did she not have the flower shop? She even has like a sighted aunt that's kind of her caretaker. So there's also like. What changed if she could see? Like, I still do not understand what changed. I mean, is it just society? Like, which I get that, like, yeah, you have more job prospects if you can see, if you're not disabled. Well, but yeah, no, it's cause still... Honestly, except except for the bit when she got sick. I'm I'm watching this movie going, wow, she's a really capable blind person. Right, right. I mean, she's not, so independent. Yeah, she... 
that flight of stairs that goes up to their house. Right, she knew. I would die on those. <laughs> I know, I know. She traverses she up and down them home. every day. Yeah. Right, right. Which like yeah, it doesn't it doesn't really make sense why why her gaining her sight because because she does get sick at one point but it really it there's no reason to believe because we she gets sick when we've already met her and we already know she's blind so it's not like when she gets sick she becomes blind like there's really no reason to believe that she's I think it's just it I think it must be that when she's sick it's just so that Charlie Chaplin can like overhear a situation with her but it doesn't like I don't remember exactly well in my in my head canon or whatever it's yeah. like there she goes in for the surgery and they're you know operating or doing whatever giving her medicine doing whatever they need to do and, oh yeah yeah uh, we'll just you know fix that problem for right. you and just you know hey as an, oh by the way as an extra bonus we <laughs> you cured your cure. blindness i know there you go <laughs> which is all yeah that's the other thing it's like what is i mean it is like such a plot device that it just it is so unreal because you have her like we've been saying like she does have the cane she does her eye lines seem realistic there are ways in which she seems like a real blind person and then you have these like just what are you talking about like a cure for blindness never, like it's all never, the same and like there's something they never ask her right do you want this because right. what obviously and, and and it's really hard to it's, talk about this because it's 2020 and this is, this is from 1931. Right, right. Like sensibilities are completely different. You know, I, I don't know if any blind people watched this in 1931. I don't know. But we're <laughs> probably not because it's, you know, it's a knows? movie that's yeah, silent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, pro- you're probably right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, who knows? And we're sitting, you know, we're sitting here in 2020 and we can say all these things. But um, hindsight like, is 2020. There yeah. you go. Exactly. We're in the right decade. <laughs> but nobody asked her. You know, are you a whole? Do you right. feel like you you are? Do you need a, this? Fine. Do you want this? Because I still get people who ask me, like, if you, oh, yeah. if you, if you, if you could wake up tomorrow or snap your fingers and you could have normal vision, would you want that? No. I've I still get people not only not just asking me that, but all, also assuming <laughs> that that's that what I want. You would that we would want that, and I'm like, <laughs> you know what? I, I've had years to think about this. Now, if you would me ask too. me that question when I was five or six, yeah, and in, in elementary school and ostracized by people, right. hell yeah. I would want to be normal because if I was normal, I would have friends. I would have friends. I could be more physical. I could be skinny. Like I could, I could drive. I could do all of these things. You ask me now and it's like, no, right. This is absolutely a a part of who I am. This is, I'm me. Yeah. And it's like, I I mean, I have a very similar thing. I mean, I wasn't diagnosed until I was 15. And for me, it was like, I wish I could drive. And like, I wanted to drive so bad. I was in Southern California. Southern California, not a great place to be a blind person, especially like in the LA area where you have to be able to drive. Transportation sucks. It's really terrible. Um, And so that, like, for me, I was like, yes, that's something I would want. But more and more, I was just like, this is society's, like, well, expectations on people, the way it's built and, like, the things that are valued and the ways in which blind people are kind of, like, made to do have to do more to do, like, the same things as sighted people. If, if this were real, if this were, <laughs> if this story were based in real, real concrete facts, um, if there was a surgery like that, and now, I mean, we're getting closer. Base, you have to admit, we're getting closer. But she would have to go through so much sensory right. training because right. you can't just right. wake up and see. I know. It doesn't work like I know, that. and and it doesn't seem like she has any vision, vision. So she's not, like, given the character and the way that it's written, it does seem like she does not have any person. Like, uh, uh, Light vision perception, whatever. Not light perception because you can not see and have light and perception. Have light, yeah. Like but, uh, um, shape, object, object perception. Object, yeah. Um, yeah. Like, but basically, yeah, having no sight at all, as opposed to ninety percent of blind people who have some sight. Um, so blindness is not the lack of sight, right? Well, I mean, it is the lack of sight, but it's not the lack of all sight. Right. 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 Sight. Yes. No. Definitely. Um, but uh, yeah. So like, uh, so the idea, and because it's like. It could be from an illness, so it could be that she didn't, like, go blind until she had already had vision for a certain period of time, but there's no reason to believe that's true, like, because it's never stated in the movie. Like, she, when she does get sick, it has nothing to do with, again, it's like it didn't cause her blindness, so, so it could be true, but it's, 
we have no reason to believe it is true that she got, that she had sight at some point, which means that she like people kill themselves because they get their vision like get vision for the first time and it is so overwhelming and unnecessary like if your brain has developed to not have vision there's no benefit to getting it like it's just not worth it yeah and I mean me personally I have not talked to a blind person who's had that surgery who's had who's done that but I've definitely heard and read you know, a, a lot of uh, a lot of them regret it. Not, yeah, I'm not saying everybody does. But most, I think most people do. Like, it is not, I, I was, like, reading something by, like, a doctor who does these kinds of things and was dealing with a lot of people, and they, it's like, yeah, most of the time people regret this. <laughs> this is not a comp. People do not. It is a majority of people who regret doing this. Like, the, that is much more common than people, like, being happy about it. And, I, you know, if you go blind when you're 30... Then, I mean, it is a different calculation because, you know, your brain, a lot of it is still like it's it has to redevelop to like blindness. Though if you've been blind long enough, it might, you know, neuroplasticity as it is, it might still be difficult. Well, yeah. well, <laughs> like if you if you talk to a person who is completely blind about, you know, what uh, talking about their memories or if you say, you know, imagine the color red or imagine a red dust. <laughs> like you know, what? What are you talking like? I, yeah. As a visual, as a person with vision, I can close my eyes and do that. Right. But for someone who who's never had those neural pathways for someone who's never it's you you think you remember you feel in, in a totally different way right and i feel like even i mean i like started losing my vision probably at a very young age like before i was 5 but but i still even though i have always like i've never had no vision um I still have trouble like visualizing things like like I do meditations and I am and like part of it is visualizations and I'm always like like a little bit more like eh, about those because it is just like it's not easy for me and I also don't feel like if I visualize something it feels far away like because it's like it would be like if someone like made puts like earmuffs on you so you couldn't hear anything and you weren't allowed to touch anything like that gives a blind person a panic attack it's like why are you making me do this and like when you visualize something that's kind of what it feels like this is this is super weird but if i'm like listening to an audiobook or uh i used to listen to all these like little radio shows (laughs) with these um christian radio shows (laughs) i have never i haven't thought about this in years adventures in odyssey they were actually really well done Uh, (laughs) seriously they were really well done anyway but i would imagine like they took place at this like magical ice cream shop or whatever (laughs) so the hardest thing for me to imagine in my head two of the hardest things are faces and rooms yeah so if i'm listening to this to a story about like we're in an ice cream shop and Da, 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 da. And I I have a lot of trouble. I can see parts of it. Like, I'll see a counter and maybe some chairs right. or something. But that's kind of sort of it. And faces are so I, hard. Are so hard. Yeah. I can't. I can't. Like, I'll try to do it with... The, sometimes I'll, like, try to do it with, like, even family members. Like, people, I'm like, these are my best chance at, like, being able to visualize someone's face. But what I can do is I can visualize the shape of their like just their frame kind of like because that's my vision is like all blurry so that is like mainly how I identify people which also leads to embarrassment when someone two people that don't actually look similar just happen to have a very similar frame (laughs) that I will never want to identify them until like they start speaking or something because I'm always so scared I'm gonna mix them up and then they'll be offended because they don't even look similar but they do to me oh god I did that that to a family on this on a ski slope oh I was so pissed off because I thought my parents had left me uh I thought they went back to the chalet without me to get cocoa or whatever and I was pissed so I walked all the way back from the chairlift to the thing and these I see these three people come over the hill and I looked at them and I just immediately like, where were you? Oh, I have no. wait, I've been down here for 20 minutes. I couldn't get my skis off. No. And then they got closer and I I realized uh, that they, they, they weren't my family. Oh, my God. I was super oh, embarrassed. That's the worst. I feel like this is that kind of thing is why I, I just never, ever call anyone by their name. I never address anyone until they address me because oh, I, I, I definitely thing. did I'm, that stuff when I was younger. I'm so scared. I'm terrified that I'll get somebody's name wrong. 
It's like, hey, you. Right, hey. right. Like, and even, it's so weird because even people that I know, like right. my improv friends, like, hey, Melissa, what's up? And I'll be like, hey, how hey, you doing? I do the good. same thing. I know exactly who you are. I know right. who you are, but the thought of saying your name and getting it wrong is, is terrifying. I'm so terrified. Me too. And I, and the funny thing is I'll sit down and I'll be like, I know like 50 people's names that I never, ever say. <laughs> like, and I know all their names and I'm like, like there's, I'm pretty, I'm 99% positive. I know their name, but I just it's never say it. Seriously, it gives me anxiety. <laughs> I know. That's why, well, what I try to do, especially with improv, at least there's like structures around this, but you, it helps to like, when you first start a class, like be like, today is the day I'm going to learn everyone's name and I'm going to get it wrong. And I'm allowed to get it wrong because it's my first time meeting people. And so I am going to like very much get it wrong if that happens. And I feel like, because I'm, I allow myself on the first day of meeting people to get their names wrong. I'm always surprised at how I do remember almost everyone's name. And since I've given myself permission, I'm, I get more confident that I'm like, oh, I know everyone's name. Like I was, I even on the first day, I had no problem. But it is, it is very stressful, and it's something that I will. If someone comes up to me, like I rarely. I'll just like I I kind of wait for people to come to me and don't and I'll call I'll use people's names like when I'm talking about them more than I will if I'm talking to them. It's, <laughs> so some of my my improv buddies have started um, saying their name when especially when I walk into the fun house because it's so oh, dark yeah. uh, and I know how to get around there now because I've right. been there for years but it's still really dark and they're like, hey hey Melissa it's it's Luna or it's Kristen or whatever and I'm like. That's so cool. I yeah. yeah, that's a that is awesome. I know I one of my work places they they try to do that and it's definitely something that um can be yeah, it's really helpful and like the oh my gosh, the like getting into s somewhere from the cuz that's kickstands where I do from um, is also just like name <laughs> drop I just all the improv it's very specific Portland yeah, improv yeah, theater yeah, yeah. um I like uh, when I walk in that bright outside if it's bright outside they like have the big room when you like where the stage is where you walk in it's like they have like the windows like covered now and so like the amount of difference is really like it's it is so much that I the second I walk in I'm just instantly like I have no idea so like we practice like on Sundays <laughs> there's like a few different practices that go on and I have a team that we're usually in the main room but I walk in and I just kind of stand there for 30 seconds and wait until I hear someone's voice I'm like oh that's a person on my team <laughs> or if no one's on my team I'm like oh I guess we're not here <laughs> but I literally have to do that so that I just like but then they also have the stairs that are so treacherous that I will just talk to whoever's in the main room for like five minutes before if I have a class downstairs I'll just talk to people upstairs for a while until I'm like my eyes are adjusting because I'm yeah, like yeah. if I go downstairs I'm gonna die yeah, so, like yeah, literally that's how my grandfather died it was he was blind and he fell down a flight of stairs because he was walking in from bright lights to like a dark place so I'm like I literally know you can die this way so yeah <laughs> Terrified that is upstairs. abjectly terrifying. Oh, yeah. my God. It is. It's very... Um, it's scary. I'm also glad that I know that that's something to worry about because I feel like the amount of, like, work it takes to avoid stairs and, like, to be careful about them really... I mean, he died when he was 40, so... Or in his 40s, I think. No, he was probably older than oh, that. Oh, thank goodness. That, that no, was like, that was he was like, question. no, no, no. Oh, my God. Because my, my dad was is the youngest, and he was tw in his 20s. So he must have been... No, he couldn't have possibly been. He, I think he was, like, closer to 60 then. That's... Maybe in his late 50s? I don't know. Now I'm like... Now I'm like, what was it? But he died before I was born, so... Um, but, yeah, he... Um, it, he was like he probably he probably lost like thirty years of his life. So I I always think like the amount of work I do to avoid stairs is is never ever gonna add up to thirty years. You know, so like I'm I'm happy to do it. <laughs> but but yeah, it is it's scary. Be be safe out there when you go into dark. 
places from yeah. the bright lights. <laughs> yeah, stairs, stairs are scary, and they are out there to get you. Yeah, they really they want you to die. <laughs> no. Um, Especially living living in Portland. The, so the the I so oh I don't think I told you this. I got cast in a play at the Clinton Street Theater. Oh, that's awesome! And, yeah, the monkey with a hat on play festival. Nice. Yes, I'm super excited, and uh, we've been rehearsing. I that's actually my next stop after here is is I have to go rehearse. Oh, cool. Uh, but we re rehearse at at a house in an older neighborhood, and there are just steps everywhere, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, Who lives like this. <laughs> steps everywhere Abled no porch people. lights yeah yeah that's who it was I'm like, porch lights I'm gonna die like, come on I mean like ADA safety is is human safety like a lot of that stuff is made for everyone and there's so many different disabilities and there are certain things that are gonna help every single disabled person you know like cause there's you know, like some things like audio descriptions really can help a lot of people. If you're deaf and you're trying to see a movie, it's probably not the most helpful thing, you know, but a lot of the, I feel like infrastructural stuff, it's like most everyone is helped by this. There's no one harmed. I mean, not even harm, but this is just like, you know, we're, this is helpful to everyone. Yeah, we're not making anybody, we're not making anybody's day harder. <laughs> right. By, by having a, by complying with ADA. Yeah, no. Well, I guess if you're like someone, I mean, the infrastructure is built to not be ADA or I mean, an ADA is just like not even that good. Like it, like it should be more than ADA. Like it, ADA does not go far enough. But like, I feel like most infrastructure because it's like not even close to it. Like it, it puts an onus on people. And I get that aspect of it. Oh, well, the, like that. It's not yeah. all just like people who are like, fuck disabled people. But it's right. still I feel like there should be more like, first of all, support to people to make things more accessible. There should be like, way more like kind of it should be more standard and like i think you know the fda makes it so that the drugs we take are going to kill us you know like there are ways for the government to step in and be like streamline this kind of stuff and and i do think you know yeah there are people it does make it harder to make a drug well and <laughs> it, I, I can't i can't comment on drugs but i, know, I can't I, metaphor. Yeah, I can say that it's it's really interesting this living here in Portland now from moving from where I'm from uh there I know there's definitely more disabled people here yeah uh than than Alaska and well there are there are plenty of disabled people in Alaska you just don't see them right which is sad but that's a whole other thing but um never have I lived in a place where I almost on the daily am questioned about my uh disability is here, yeah. By it's, really, it's randos who are, and the the worst is like, the worst possible way you can start a conversation with me is just walking up and be like, "Hey, why are you blind?" What? I've literally what gotten that question. What answer are you expecting? Have you always been blind? And I'm just like, you know what? Today, I don't feel like educating you. Today, oh that's my not God. my job. Um, the movie. Uh, there was a movie theater by my house that I used to frequent because it was by my house. Right. And uh, stop me if I've told you this story. Uh, but I have, on three or four separate occasions, have had to fight um, to get disability services there. Oh, yeah. It like is... to get audio descriptions and stuff? No, well, or not, not, not even that. that? Just to get a handicapped seat. Oh, my gosh. Because, and it, it brought up a really interesting interesting fact. So a guy, uh, I had an altercation with, uh, with a box office person because he wouldn't give me a handicapped seat. And I'm like, I sit in these seats because it's not the very front of the theater where I have to crane my neck right. but it's not the very back of the theater where i can't yeah. see anything it is in the right they're for disabled optimal, people yeah and he's like well but but they're um they're wheel they're wheelchair seats they're they're you know you you have to be in a wheelchair to sit in them or sit near them what and that brings up a whole thing ada law and again i'm not an expert so please correct me if i'm wrong but I mean, AD, i'm not an expert either but yeah, yeah. <laughs> ada was uh spearheaded by a, by people in wheelchairs right i mean a lot of the stuff is specific to wheelchairs mm-hmm. and from what i can tell from what i've heard like from people who use wheelchairs it doesn't it's it's just as like like ineffective you know like that a lot of things are ada compliant that still are not accessible right. for people who use wheelchairs right like so 
It doesn't even do a very good job at that. <laughs> no. Well, and this guy at the box office was like, those seats are for people who have a mobility disability. Oh. Which is just like, also, by like, the way, blindness is a mobility disability. Yeah. Like, if you, like, you can't, why do you think we have a cane? <laughs> like, no, I have literally held my cane up. We get up. mobility training is right. what they call it. Right. I held my cane up and was like, so this is a mobility device. <laughs> yeah. What? the? It's, that is so... It's stupid. It's so and then, dumb. And so I got him to sell me the seat. And then I went into the theater. And I was late now. And I went into the theater after getting my snacks. And literally the whole row of disabled seats, all of it were a- taken up by able-bodied people. Oh, I was God. so angry. That's so dumb. I was so mad. So I, I sat in the very front row. And... It was, it was a simple favor is what I went to see. And literally, I can't tell you what happened in the first 20 minutes of that movie because I was seething. I was so upset. I would be too. So I actually went to the manager uh, and told him what had happened or whatever. And I got uh, I got three free movies out of it. Oh. So that was cool. Well, that's good. That, he's he's that's very nice, nice, the manager over at that, at that particular theater. He's a nice guy. That's it. I'm glad that's the end of the story. Because there's definitely been... I've had a lot of times just trying to get, like... Uh, audio like description stuff has been a real hassle because I do I sit like first or second row I luckily have a family that always did that (laughs) so that was like where I grew up sitting so it was never something that um I had to like choose to do even but um but I think partly because I have like I don't have central vision I use all my peripheral vision is what I use. So like the closer up, it really is more accessible for me. So that makes it a lot more, a lot easier to go because people don't want to sit in the front usually. (laughs) So usually you can get the seats that you need, even when you don't like, which is like concerts, whole other story, um, because people want to be at the front. And I've had people who, that's another complaining. Yeah, don't get get started on concerts and theater. That's a whole other subject. (laughs) But at least with movies, for my specific needs, I can usually can get a seat. But that's and they're the only thing I can I can get an easy seat for. Everything else is a, is a fucking to do. You, um, to, you have to decide like what you want to see six months in, in advance because you have oh to save God. at least three hundred dollars. Oh my god! Yeah, no. Oh gosh. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna complain about this when we have an, an extra hour. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, no. It's really the audio descriptions is the hardest thing, and we should. Since I'm thinking, we could probably, if like, wrap up our our final thoughts. Yes, we should do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but this has been a great no, conversation. This has been awesome. This has been so yeah. much fun. Um, all, all in all, I mean, I guess the simple question is the first simple question I think is, um, did you like the movie, and would you recommend right. would you recommend it for someone to watch? Be it be them cited or not cited, I think um, recommend someone to watch it. I mean. If it's like that or like D.W. Griffith for like film history, I mean, go for it. <laughs> like, don't go for City Lights, not D.W. Griffith. Um, yeah, no, he's no, racist. no. Fuck that guy. But, um, but I think, I mean, this is something in film school that I thought a lot about is just like how much do, like, I think it can be sometimes helpful to watch like the beginnings of things, but then sometimes there's also a sense of like, how important is it like and I, I I still am not really sure how I feel about it and if I like I bring up D.W. Griffith just because I think that that's like a shining example of maybe you just don't even need to bother because it's like so offensive now that it's not even worth it um but but I think that like I get I even though I tend to lean towards like you don't need to like watch the beginning of something if you have watched many many examples of it already that maybe have like a more progressive you know stance on the world because the older something is the more like usually in narrative like if it's older it's more problematic not yeah, always but well, I mean, I, no absolutely and this is this is a conversation that we're having today i mean it's 
Um, yeah. Yeah, we're having it, but we're also, as a society, right. having it. <laughs> about, you know, canceling things. So you, right, you, bring, right. you bring up, like, Birth of a Nation. No, I mean, I think that film is abhorrent. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to wake up Saturday morning and be like, hmm, I'm going to watch Birth of a Nation today. <laughs> But um, but I absolutely think that those things should be seen. But you need to you need to have well, okay the so context the context. Yeah. I I really oops, I really admire the uh, the Warner Brother uh, Warner Brothers cartoons the Looney Tunes box sets. Oh yeah, because we watched a bunch of them in my social studies class because my high, my high school social studies teacher was awesome, and we wa- we were studying World War Two and so we watched a lot of the racist ones and I mean they're bad they're yeah. bad they're super racist. However, instead of trying to hide them like other companies, <laughs> no, right. like other companies might, uh, Warner's has put them out there with a disclaimer. You know, these are from another period. These are from another time. You know, we, yeah. we don't we don't reflect. The, you know, the, the, this is not like the values we hold. Right. Right. Well, it's exactly. kind of like the when we talk about like the um confederate memorials though the difference between the confederate memorials and this is that like the movies are plucked from the time period whereas the confederate memorials are were political moves that were far after the civil war so they don't actually represent a time period they weren't created at like it's really more like like the Holocaust, like going to concentration camps that are still there, like you like preserving them as a way of like seeing like what that, you know, that seeing that history in the context of it. And I don't and I think there is value to that. Like, I think that, you know, like, I mean, to, to push the Holocaust metaphor more, I mean, like people do deny that it existed. And so having these like these concrete remembrances of them, I think there is definitely value in contextualizing that and using it to not forget something that we want to, like, have learned a lesson from, if, theoretically. Yeah, I mean, if we, <laughs> if we forget our history, we're doomed to repeat it. Right. If we rub our, try and erase it, well, we're just going to repeat it again eventually. Right. And I, yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, I, I have no desire to... Or on a regular basis, like to watch a bunch of you know old racist <laughs> right, right. cartoons, or or you know a bunch of all the Nazi. Right, but World then that's the question cartoons. in like capitalist society, like what? Why do we need this still? No, no, I get, it. <laughs> I, I totally get where you're coming yeah, from. Yeah. I, I, I just, I still think that that type of art in in uh, in a context should absolutely be, right. be made available for like people. Like in history to class to, <laughs> to sure. contextualize it. Yeah, to, exactly. Exactly. Or if you're yeah. studying, if you're studying animation or you're studying film or something, you should have access. But then things. that's the question. Cause like, I think D.W. Griffith gets showed not to be like, we're racist and this is the racist perspective we used to have, but more like, this is how the beginning of narrative filmmaking and Correct. how the editing, you know, created a storyline. And so like, how much is that helpful? in a film class to go to the first thing when you're not contextualizing it for the cultural things and like the a lot of times you know I think there are definitely film classes where you are looking at things contextually but a lot of times when in something like G.W. Griffith gets used specifically to talk about film and not to talk about the bigger cultural context but you kind of just have to because he kind of makes you do that because it is so offensive but then there's a question of if you have to then talk about like all of the racist things that are in the movie and you're in a class where you're just learning about film editing it's like maybe maybe you just don't need it you know like like what sir what what purpose does it serve after a certain point when we've had like you know another hundred years or whatever uh, like maybe a little bit less but like of of using the stuff that was beginning then like we now have used it so much that there's you know it's not like we're we're losing examples of how editing works you know (laughs) no no exactly and i and i got i actually got into a conversation about this with somebody oh god i think it was on the bus i don't remember but I think the reason why we come back to that sort of thing, and um, I think it was with my roommate I was having this conversation. Anyway, point is, is unfortunately, uh, Hollywood and the history of film is intrinsically racist. Right. (laughs) Yeah. You can't really get around it. It's there because it was built in to the culture. 
Yeah. So yeah, it's it's hard because I'm I wish we could come up with a better example than Birth of a Nation. Yeah. And and I'm sure you could use another film something anything Ishtar anything he made other movies. <laughs> well, Ishtar's some of them are very movie. offensive too. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh no, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because <laughs> is, unfortunately it is Film reflects the society in the right. time that it's made. Yeah. So you, and if you're going to, to learn and study and watch, you have to do it with context. Right. Especially when you're looking at something that's, well, from a past time. But at the same time, I think like even now, like, and this is something we'll explore a lot on this podcast, um, is that like uh, filmmakers don't know how to portray disabled characters. The disabled characters today are 99% of the time still tropes. They're still like, like really misunderstanding of what disability is, or they're used as like a metaphor for something or, you know, kind of like some sort of you know, wish fulfillment or, you know, like or, they're, they're very devoid from actual people's yes, experience. Yes. Or the, or the worst thing is able, it's all the able-bodied play actors who are playing. Right. Right. And, I, uh, yeah. Yeah. And actually um, another idea I have, I have an idea for a movie we should, for the movie we should do next week, <laughs> oh. but um, in future um, uh, we need to talk about peanut butter Falcon. Oh, and I don't even know this movie. Oh, oh my God. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this is, this is, the fact that this movie got no nominations this year at the Oscars is just a fucking crying shame. Oh, it just came out last year because this oh, was wow. the this was literally this and Little Women were the best movies I saw last year. Oh yeah, and last year was like very recently because the Oscars yes. just happened. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> so Peanut Butter Falcon is it's Shia LaBeouf uh, wrote it and stars in it. Oh wow, and he. Um, very vague plot synopsis because I don't want to spoil anything. Right. It is it is like a modern day Tom and Huck. Oh, I do. But yeah, like but the character he meets, Zach, it is played by an actor who is well, the actor's name, real name is Zach. Also, um, this actor has Down syndrome. Oh, yeah. So it's like watch, like watch something like Sam I Am. That's the movie I, I <laughs> always bring up. Watch Sam I Am, and then watch Peanut Butter Falcon. It is like night and day. Yeah, because and it's real. It's real and it's beautiful and it's am- amazingly impactful because the character who's playing the character with Down syndrome is a person who has Down right. syndrome. Right. I mean, it really is. If you think about it, just I mean, it is. It's blackface. It's the same thing. <laughs> like you know, it's still like a, someone from a privileged group playing someone from a group that doesn't have the same privilege they have. For no reason at all, because it's not like there aren't plenty of really talented disabled actors to hire. And also, like, abled actors who don't have as much film experience get cast all the time. <laughs> like, if you don't if you don't know of a good blind actor, find one. <laughs> like, like, you know, and then start some good careers of, you know, and I mean, not just blind, but like uh, of disabled actors. And then, you know, the filmmakers of the future won't won't even have that ex- like it couldn't even make that excuse when there's a, a bunch of like you know well-known famous like well, and not, disabled actors yeah and i mean not only do we need more disabled actors we need more disabled filmmakers yes because absolutely. if the adage is write what you know uh we need more disabled right. people behind the scenes to write you can this tell stuff. you you can tell you write what you know and there's no disabled people in hollywood just by watching movies about disabled people <laughs> I mean, granted, Shia wrote <laughs> Peanut Butter Falcon, but right. he wrote it with the input of Zach. You know, right. he wrote it, He they met at a party or something, I can't remember how, and it, the the conversation got around to like, well, what do you want to do? And Zach was like, I want to be an actor, I want to be in movies. But obviously, nobody's casting him. Right. So Shia was like, okay. So he wrote this movie, and it's yeah. amazing. <laughs> That's, I mean, yeah. That, I think there, I think there should be more... Disabled people. I mean, I, I, I hope that soon you won't even need an able person. Yeah, that it will just be like disabled writers um, writing movies. Though I mean, TV probably more. The writers have more say. My, my happy place is like. Wouldn't it be cool to just you know? This is a show I would absolutely not watch. But like <laughs> some like stupid you know romantic sitcom or whatever show or you know whatever like. You know, Lindsay's looking for love in New York City. You know, just like some stupid 
shit. But the main character of this show is blind or legally blind or uses a cane or is in a wheelchair. Yeah. Just they yeah. are. And that's not what the, that's not what the story is about. It's like, okay, it's like um I can't even remember if this show's on the air, but Speechless. We should watch oh, yeah. we should watch a couple of episodes. I have of seen that show. Yeah. I saw yeah, the first yes. season. I mean, yes, the, the show is about primarily is about the oh, uh, the character who ha- who is disabled, but it's not that's not the focus of the show. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's something um that is maybe I, I'm always wondering if that's like the next step or if we still have another step before we get to that step of like having characters because yeah because I, I feel like still so so much of disabled portrayal are like stories of people becoming disabled or, or people really over- center around the disability or people overcoming disability right able-bodied people eat that shit up yes it's able people stories well, you know, and another another thing we could do um, that we could talk about is not a film. However, it is my favorite Wonder Woman story in comics is the one where she uh, gives up her sight to fight Medusa. Oh, that is super cool because you think about these superheroes who are like gods, especially if you're talking about DC. It's basically stories of, you know, how do these gods figure out they're human and Marvel is the opposite. <laughs> I, I'm not a comic scholar. I can't say it. No, you know. I mean, you sound like one. I like that take. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but it's my favorite Wonder Woman story. And she is blind for um, a couple of issues afterwards as well. I mean, she has to fight. She has to give up her sight to fight Medusa. And then she has to go to the underworld blind okay. uh, to rescue somebody. And she does it without without any vision at all. And um, Does she then get her sight back? I believe, yeah, she yeah. Gets her, of course she gets her sight back. Right, but, of course. but I got to talk to Greg Rucka, who was the guy who wrote that story, a set of stories, and uh, I I thanked him, honestly, because I'm just like, thank you for having ma- anything. I, well, yeah, but like I felt validated. <laughs> right, right. The stories. That's you know, what like, I mean. It's yeah. It's so cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I said it in a ruder way. <laughs> no, it's okay. That's what I meant. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. But yeah, I mean, well, you know, Wonder Woman isn't necessarily a blind character, she, right? But, but the fact that this character is blind, and when Wonder Woman is blind, you know, she doesn't curl up in a ball. What am I going to do? You know, how am I going to live the rest of my life? Like she gets up and kicks some ass. Yeah, that's. I mean, yeah. So I think that's something that we should maybe look into Doing, checking out. Yeah, yeah. talking well, about a little bit. We need to find like um, things where they read you the comics. I know, They're I know. To, they, yeah, they only have them available for some things because they they actually in the latest Wonder Woman animated movie, which is pretty good. Um, they they smash that story at the very 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 tail end. Oh, she fights. She has to fight Medusa, and then she takes away her sight. But it's sad because uh, it did, <laughs> everything about that story is awesome and they do it in like the last five minutes of the movie. Of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's, uh, yeah. Actually, there is something that you can download on Audible. I can't remember if it's still free or not, but that comic series that I love, Lock and Key, there, there is a, it's like 13 hours long and it's a dramatized audio full cast recording of the oh entire comic book series. If only they did that for all comics. I know. I mean, the one problem is it's not sustainable. No. <laughs> At least someone, like, reading them is like, okay, you know, if someone reading them and describing what's happened, mm-hmm. that feels like we could do that for a lot of comics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the lock, but the lock and key stuff is very well done. That's, well, we'll, we'll have to, and we, we should also do um, recommendations, too, you know, on top yes, of that. Yes, definitely. Oh, my God, we still haven't even talked about, like, if we even liked the damn movie. Right. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's what <laughs> we got, I was going to talk about. A tangent. Uh, okay. Let's see. Um, did I like it? Am I glad I saw it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm not a fan of uh, of the fact that the the cure for the for blindness is the blind character getting her sight back. I actually yeah. thought she was a really n- neat and capable character. Me too. Without sight. Yeah. So that uh, makes me sad. Am I am I glad I saw it? Sure. I mean, I'd never seen it before, and I'd always wanted to watch it. I just hadn't really had a reason to yet. So yeah, I think that I'm, and I I did see it like in high school. So it's been like a decade since I've seen it. So I I 
I'm very only remembered a few things. Um, and I think, I mean, I think in some ways, like the fact, because I, I vacillate on if it's like cool or very depressing that like, I don't know how much farther we've come. <laughs> it's nice to see that even that long ago, there was some effort put in depicting a blind person in not a completely like it is somewhat stereotypical but it it, it could it there there's a lot worse stereotypical stuff like the way that she interacts with the world feels a lot more like realistic than you know things that well came after but still like to know that in the 30s that that was still something that could be possible that is nice. Um, the fact that we haven't come very far is extremely depressing. So, so I guess I fall somewhere in the middle, but that's more what, like the context of the movie, you know, I think it's not, I, I think it is not offensive enough of a portrayal of blind people to like, you know, it's not birth of the nation for right. blind people. Yeah. Like it yeah. is, it is as a depiction, it's tropey, but it's really not like, it could be a lot worse. I mean, there, is, <laughs> there is a birth of the nation for blind people. It's Ooh. called blindness. Yes. Oh, it yes. exists. <laughs> so we'll get to the birth of a nation for blind people oh, later in this God. podcast. Does that mean we have to watch that stupid thing again? I think you have to watch it again. Yeah, we'll we'll Jesus do we'll Christ. watch them in our last episode. We'll we'll watch some other movies in before we have to watch that one again. But um, but yeah, so I think that in a lot of ways, I, I mean, I think that it is like as a movie that there's a lot of really succinct comedic timing and stuff. And and the the movies Chaplin makes. I mean, this is extremely like basic film student argument, but I, like <laughs> there is something about like you know Chaplin, and I mean, I think also Bester Keaton that like you from that era. There is so much that like you know that that, that comedic timing and that kind of physical humor. Yeah, this is important to film, and it's also something that doesn't get done as much as it probably should as, now. As a person who enjoys comedy, as people who do improv, yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, I think looking back at Chaplin stuff is is important. If yeah, you wanna do if you want to do physical work, I mean, yeah, Chaplin, Buster Keaton, the Mar the Marx right. Brothers. All of that stuff. And it is something that I even think about, like, yeah, in doing improv and stuff, I'll sometimes, like, watch some of that stuff for inspiration of the way that it's done. And I think, like, watching this, because, like, the first time I watched it was in film school, and I was looking at it for its filmic stuff, which I think, I mean, I don't, it's not, there's nothing that really, I mean, it is, like, other than being, like, a silent, like, a, a kind of, you know, pristine example of like silent films I guess like uh, and and I think the scoring is really interesting we didn't even talk about that um, <laughs> but um but seeing it from that perspective you know I think it does a decent amount I think also coming now from like you know now doing much more improv and thinking more about staging and like you know physical comedy I I feel like it's probably more even more beneficial to look at it from that lens even than just kind of the more like kind of uh bird's eye view film stuff like it doesn't it's not I, yeah I mean I you don't other than the scoring is interesting um that that's the one thing that I think it really does filmically um that's cool but um but yeah, I think it is a good study in 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 physical comedy, and and to have a blind character um, that isn't extremely offensive and isn't like creating like it, like perpetuating super toxic ideas. Though I mean, the cure for blindness thing is I I guess is the super toxic idea, but it's also like something that I don't think a movie from the thirties is really going to not, change really cons anyone's mind. Concerned about it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, because and I think also like people still think that now. So if you watch a movie from the thirties, you're not like I think there are certain things that like the more you see it in media, like the fact that like blindness is ignorance and people become stupid. Like that stuff just feels so toxic. Mm -hmm. Whereas like the blind people wanting to be cured, I think is a problematic thing that people seem to always believe. <laughs> and so I think it being in a movie, it's like either you think that or not. I don't know if a movie would really like, you know, it's because it's not, it's something that people will tell, will say outright. So if a movie is saying it, 
it, well, I mean, yeah. I don't think I don't think this is actively going to harm right. a sighted person who who's who's watching it. I don't think they're going to think less of blind of, a blind, of blind people. Right, they, right. And you know, they might get the wrong idea about what a blind person wants. But now something that it wasn't like watching blindness, where I'm just like, this right. is openly. Um, disgusting and dis- and, really and disgraceful dis- disgraceful towards yeah. blind people and because it's also like the blind character starts out the movie blind so i think that they're the movie even if the movie still falls into the trap of only asking you to empathize when the character has sight the fact that they st- that she starts out blind i feel like puts at least all of the blind content in the realm of like sighted people are maybe not even empathizing with her <laughs> You know, so at least they're not seeing it as like, oh, if I went blind, I would be like a monster, like, which is when it becomes, I I feel like when you just enter a new layer of like toxicness, whereas it just the fact that like she, the people, I mean, and society does tells blind people what they want. Like all the things that happen to her are accurate, you know, like it's, it's hard to make money. You like people tell you what you want, you become dependent on people and you can't really know if they have your best interests at heart like other people think you want to be cited when like you have like less ability to get a good job so I mean it says all that stuff and all that stuff is true it's just you know maybe the the reasoning that the movie thinks is different than the reality but it isn't inaccurate (laughs) yes but yeah very well said but I mean as as far as you know would uh, if somebody wants to, you know, it's, it's, again, it's city lights. It's not going to harm anybody. Yeah. It's. <laughs> That's our, our stamp of approval. Yeah, harmless. Yeah. It's harmless. Yeah. There you go. That's good. That's good. Yeah. It's, we, we deem this film harmless. Harmless. Um, so we're going to give it, we're each going to give a, um, blindness acuity score. Right. Um, so 2020 would be like just a sighted person thought of the movie in every way and said like no blindness (laughs) like a very bad portrayal i think would be 2020 Mm -hmm. um 2200 is legal blindness so that would be like if you're you know really hitting your your marks anything above 200 is really doing a great job and then anything below 20 is doing a terrible job (laughs) so yeah uh, honestly i would i would probably put this 2200 i wasn't really I wasn't, um, I wasn't offended. Yeah. The only, the only thing that I, that I didn't sit well with me was the ending. But as far as, right. well, well, that and she's a damsel in distress. But except for those two things, I mean, honestly, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm Just, okay. That's, that's good. I, I, I feel like I give it more like a 2080. I feel like there's a lot of ways it could have been better um at portraying blindness but i think like all of the um yeah i mean all of the the ways that she the way she interacted with the world when she was able to like do things for herself felt real and i think there's a lot of movies i also have very high standards of things so that's maybe why mine is so much lower um, okay. <laughs> uh, which i'm very hard to please um, <laughs> this, will, but, this will be an interesting journey then yeah it's good We're, we have a good like we'll we'll even e- mm-hmm. our, each other out i think so yes so here is my uh, so now that we've done that, yeah, yeah. here's my proposal for next week. Yeah. Uh, cause it's my week. So yes. I, I want to talk about something really offensive. Okay. Have you seen men in tights? No. Mel Brooks, men in tights. Good. Okay. There's a character in men in tights. Uh, his name is Blinken and he is Robin Hood's blind servant. Okay. <laughs> That's this. That sounds. I'm. I'm excited. <laughs> good. Good. Um, yeah. And I. Uh, there's something that I w- that I really want to share with you, but I don't know if I want to share it. I don't know. Is if it I wa- about the movie? It's about the actor who plays who plays this character. Let's and, save it for next. Week. Okay. Because I'm like, I don't know if I want to show it. I want to get your like. I want to get your genuine reaction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a video clip. So. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll figure it out. But let's we'll we'll announce it today but then we'll we'll do we'll do the all the analyzing in the next episode yeah yeah so yeah so let's do um mel brooks robin hood men in tights that's i'm excited cool um okay so to finish up we'll just uh we're gonna do 
if we're gonna each come up with a thing that's not necessarily blindness related, but just some piece of media or just thing in general that that we're enjoying. Um, stuff that we like this week. Yeah, stuff we like this week. I like that. <laughs> that's what we should call that it. That works. <laughs> Um, call a spade a spade yeah. stuff that we like this week that's good to the point audio descriptions they just tell you the important stuff without all the frills um, <laughs> <laughs> do you want to go first sure the, so i have two things for what uh for what i liked um i've uh first is brief the second is not so brief first one is uh i loved that parasite won uh the 2020 oscar for best picture i think that's a really good step in the right direction it is a movie that is very uh, almost inaccessible for for us to watch, which makes me sad and a little angry. Yeah. But it just means we have to work harder uh, to watch this movie because apparently it's amazing. Apparently, I've been hearing about that. Yeah. So woohoo! That was really cool. So my actual thing though is uh, Birds of Prey, the movie Birds of Prey. Okay. So I've already seen it twice. <laughs> I. I love it. It is. It's not a perfect film. I mean, what <laughs> film is? Right, of course. Uh, but it's so awesome. It's directed. It's directed by a woman. Um, it's Harley Quinn. It's Huntress. It's Renee Montoya and um, Black Canary. It's like why can't I remember Black Canary? <laughs> and they're just ladies kicking ass and being awesome. That's awesome. And it makes me so happy. And this movie isn't. It's not about sexualizing them. Right. Which is really cool. Yeah. Uh, it's just about them kicking ass and being awesome. And Ewan McGregor plays a <gasps> fantastic villain. Oh, my God. Well, you have me at Ewan McGregor. Yay! No more. Good, <laughs> good. 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 No, it's great. It's great. I've already seen it twice. Please go see it. It's fantastic. Awesome. That's, that's really cool. So my um, thing that I'm digging this, I mean few months because it came out a little bit ago um is the tv show that is on amazon i believe um yeah it's on it's an amazon original um called undone it's um technically about a disabled person as the main character so not totally off topic of that but um it is a really great portrayal and if we do go get into other disabilities because it because she has, like, a hearing impairment. Um, so we could always talk about this show, but I think just it is a rotoscoped show. Um, so it is very, like, you know, identifiable because that's not a common <laughs> technique. That, and it is, like, it's very, like, uh, I, just the worlds that it kind of inhabits. It's about, like mental health and like but it's also about spirituality and and death and disability it's but um the one of the creators is Raphael bob waxberg who's like my favorite forever because i uh, bojack horseman is my favorite tv show of um, the last decade we, we <laughs> should just i know everybody else has done it but we should seriously have a a a very long conversation about bojack horseman oh i'm i mean if we're gonna do an episode a bonus. I mean, there's not a blind character, but I would do an episode for every season of that show. Yes. Yes, <laughs> um, yes, 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 yes. But yeah, so, but it is, but since it, it just, um, it just ended, this is um, a new project. Um, mm -hmm. I There's nothing like it. It's kind of, it has a, it almost is like kind of like a Russian doll. It's similar to that in like, in the kind of circular there's like circular nature and it's very much about spirituality and like trauma and going back and get so it, it, there's a lot of commonalities with russian doll <laughs> but it is it, it has more even more of like a disability um theme as well um and it's only 10 episodes or like half hour um it's a really it's a really cool show so i'm excited to um have more seasons of it oh you sold me on that, that yeah yeah i didn't know it, he was the creator so, yeah yeah no i definitely want to check that out because it's, it's been on my it's been on my watch list for a while yeah it's been out for a bit i'm I, did it come out in the summer 
No, I can't remember. I, I can't remember either, but <laughs> Next it's, time, well. Yeah. This is so blind people, we don't look at our, you know, some people can, like, Google things and look, and for us, if there's a microphone in our face, it's harder to look at stuff, so just <laughs> yes. a disclaimer. True, true. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, so that, um, I think, wraps up our, our first, in, our inaugural episode. We did it. We did it. Yay. Thank, Hooray. <laughs> thank you for listening. Um We'll probably have social media at some point. Um, no. No. Dot, dot, dot. Yeah, yeah. Um, that will we'll, be your job. I once we get it. I crap about social media. I, oh, my God. I don't. I can't do social media. Um, but I, I'll try to figure it out. I really want... We'll have to figure something out, but I do want there to be a way for people to, like, send us voice Oh, definitely, stuff, cause yeah. Because that, yeah. I'm just, like, if that could be it, then means that blind people more like, because yes. I don't write into my favorite yes. podcast, because I'm like, oh, but I, then I have to look at something. Mm-hmm. So, because I want to hear from blind people, and then we could even, like, play it on the podcast. That would be really be cool. Super yeah, because cool. uh, I, I need recommendations for movies, because I'm, like, I'm on the seat of my pants. I mean, I've always right. wanted to talk about men in tights with another blind person. So that's, so I've that's had, cool. I've had that in, on the back. But we're going to very quickly run out of, and we can always <laughs> talk to other people. Like we might get like sighted guests on yes. at some point. So oh, a suggestion for something to talk about was, uh, the book of Eli. If you haven't seen that. no, We'll have to. <laughs> that would be good. That would be a good one too. We there'll be lots of movies to come. I was looking up lists online, and there it, it turns out there actually is a decent amount of movies oh, with yeah. blind characters. Oh yeah. Oh and obviously, obviously we have to talk about Son of a Woman because I've never oh actually God. seen Son of a There's, Woman. I am excited because I like. D- honestly I'm always like I don't want to see a movie if it has a blind character because I know it's just going to make me like it's going to be that potential energy of just like I am shaking because I need to like either complain about this mostly complain but like maybe sometimes be excited about <laughs> with another blind person so should I'm we talk? should we talk about the um the Ben Affleck masterpiece that watched Daredevil. <gasps> oh, absolutely. Yes. We will definitely do that. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so this is all the <laughs> preview for what's to come um, in this next season. Um, but thank you all for listening to our first episode. Um, and and we'll, we promise we'll get um, some sort of way to get in touch with us soon. Yes. <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs> Listen, our theme song was written and performed by the amazing Lucia Fasano. You can check her out um, at luciafasano.bandcamp.com. She has a lot of really great stuff. Um, we did get social media. So you can follow us on Twitter at White Cane Pod or on Instagram at Citizen White Cane. Uh, you can send us an email to citizenwhitecanepod at gmail.com. And, um, of course, don't forget to subscribe and rate and review and all that stuff. Yeah, cool. Thank you. See you in a couple weeks. Bye.